Welcome to the Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. This show is for entrepreneurs. They have chosen to define their life beyond the material. They have followed their soul on a hero's journey towards the mystery of the spiritual. I'm your host, Garrett Moon. Each episode will be learning from awakened entrepreneurs and spiritual thought leaders. They have broken through the mold of being ordinary to extraordinary, challenging our paradigm, shining lights to the dark, giving hope when there is doubt. The moment of truth is upon us. It is time to transcend our world from fear to love. Are you ready? Let's go. Hi, welcome to the Awakening Entrepreneur Podcast. Today, I've got a very special guest, my dear friend, Ivy Kwong. When I met her in one of the Mind Valley uh, Festival called Awesomeness Fest, I see this beautiful woman that's full of love, radiance, just shining throughout the room. She lights up the whole room and people sparks joy whenever they are in her presence. And what really intrigued me in that particular event, we all got specific title that we put a box or label around ourselves, whether I'm online marketer, whether I'm a serial entrepreneur, and her is a transformational dominatrix. For this woman that is just so gracious and beautiful and full of love, and I don't know what dominatrix, but from stereotype, like you think is some dark mystery. That it's almost like the light in the dark. We've got this angel looking person and then we've got the dark side and it really intrigued me. But I want to give you a little bit of background about her. So she grew up as an Asian in the Midwest of America. And as Asian, you either go to a stream of doctor, lawyers, accountants, and she ended up choosing the path of being an attorney. And after a few years through different stories, different events in her life that you get to learn about, she transitioned to a marriage and family therapist, and then eventually to help people with some of the deeper healing from her own personal journey and uh, witnessing some of the deep needed work that's needed in society, she transformed into a transformative or professional dominatrix. And now she's gone through a deep awakening and spiritual journey in the last few years, and she's come all the way back incorporating all the skills that she's learned and being a healer, being a lover. And mostly one of the things that I've been called to also get to share, which is very rare in this age, is codependency. Especially in the intimate relationship, the society of things that marriage is the only form and the only structure. You sign a contract, you bind for life. And I think that we're very limiting in that paradigm in how we are engaged with each other because of our contracts versus because we choose to or is our path. So I want to explore that topic of codependency. And what I really like about Ivy, she's so open, raw and real and happy to share her wisdom with us. And on the other side, she's met people from all walks of life, from Richard Branson to the everyday person. Like she doesn't judge you because you're certain status, certain class, certain wealth. And she just talks to everyone, love everyone and be in the present with everyone. So she loves snowboarding and refugio backpacking. I don't know what that is, but I think it's um, something cool and fun. I must try one day. So welcome, Ivy. Hi, Gary. Great to be here. <laughs> it's quite an <Man>. opening. <laughs> You're one of the guests I have on is so much mystery about you, but yet it's almost like you've gone through to experience the light and the dark so that we don't have to. One thing I forgot to share, you've had five engagements with a previous partner and being from a very traditional Asian family, even one failed engagement, it seems like it's an embarrassment, there's judgment on it from a lot of the family. It's like, hush, hush, let's not talk about it. So man, where should we start? Um, how was growing up process for you? Like, What was growing up like? Uh, you've got a beautiful book that you recently um, created as well. Yeah, for for children, for adults who were once children and for little kids about remembering the dreams that you had when you were little that you may have lost along the way. So, yeah, in terms of childhood, I grew up the child of immigrants. 
I'm first generation uh, Asian American. My parents are from China and uh, Hong Kong and Macau. And so I grew up in kind of two worlds, one in the Midwest, where, you know, super the heartland of America, corn and soybeans. Where I was born, actually, Kokomo, Indiana, the KKK had a very strong presence there. The Grand Dragon of the KKK, the head of the KKK, actually lived there. And so, as you can imagine, growing up Asian in a space where there's a lot of like white supremacy all around you, it's an interesting place to grow up. And so I am the eldest of four girls. My parents wanted a boy. <laughs> they had four girls. They tried really hard. Um, and growing up, there was wanting to fit in and to belong and not really quite fitting in in the Midwest and not really quite fitting in to my community, my family when I'd go back to Hong Kong for the summers. You know, so there's kind of trying to live in very different worlds and not knowing where I belonged. My wife, she's got three older sisters as well, but mm -hmm. the only difference is they finally had a boy at the end. <laughs> <laughs> tried one more time. <laughs> yeah, so I guess like growing up, you're very traditional. Your parents probably very disciplined. Were they like busy working or one of them looking after you guys? How was that arrangement? Yeah, my father worked as an engineer. He worked at General Motors. So he was the only uh, breadwinner of the family. My mother's very traditional roles. My mother stayed home. She was a housewife. She raised the daughter. She cooked. She cleaned. And there was very much an expectation that, you know, you will work hard. You will be successful. And getting a, you know, high paying job and becoming a doctor or lawyer, that's what you have to do. And there was very conditional love as well growing up. My parents, I imagine perhaps many Asian parents, didn't say I love you, didn't hug, didn't uh, ever once say I'm proud of you. There was always a very strict, this is not good enough, you should do more, you should work harder, A minus, oh, why isn't A plus, you know, just very much that upbringing. And so feeling like I had to achieve for them to love me and to want to do whatever they ask so that they would approve. And so there was a lot of struggle with that, too, because I was the, also the black sheep of the family. I had a lot of feelings. I had a lot of emotions. I remember one of my earliest memories is sitting in front of the television, watching the news with my parents. And there was a car crash and the parents had died and there was a child that had been orphaned. And I started to cry. My parents were like, why are you crying? That's a stranger. You don't even know that person. And I'm like, but that person doesn't have a mommy or a daddy. And I was feeling empathy. My parents were like, you just have to worry about yourself. No one in the world is going to worry about you. So you worry about yourself and your family. That's all that matters. No one else will care. And of course, they were speaking from their experience, you know, as immigrants coming to a strange and foreign land where they didn't get support, where they were on their own, where they faced discrimination and racism and harassment. And so they were just trying to protect us with what they knew, but these are the stories that I was told and the beliefs that were embedded in me growing up. Mm. Recently, just the last few days, I was looking to the birth order, like from a spiritual meaning. Um, apparently, being a first child, it means that your older soul and you've came here to, to willing to take on a lot of the responsibility and, and burden for the, your other siblings. So people say that the, the oldest one get the toughest part from the parents' side. And the second one, they get more freedom because of what their parents did um, mm -hmm. to the older child is basically created a shield and the second one have more freedom now. And the third one, they dare to create joy because uh, mm -hmm. by the time you have the third, I've got three child now. It's like, hey man, I don't have the time to, to do the <laughs> micromanaging anymore. Anything goes. Like, <laughs> and, and just getting the older sibling to look after the younger one. And my wife is just a fourth child as well. She sees herself as a dark sheep. And I would say that she's a challenger to the existing paradigm or framework um, mm -hmm. that is. So it's interesting that that's the parallel that as the fourth child or maybe the younger child, you get room to, uh, it's almost at the level of consciousness. Like the Claire Graves like, model of the world, you've got the purple, I need to be part of a group because I don't feel safe. And then the next level, you've got the red, which is the power person, you get more freedom. So kind of like the second child. The third one is blue, you want to stay in the order, stay in the pack, like conform to society. And then the fourth one, entrepreneur, which is just challenging the paradigm. So you like the entrepreneur, like, hey, you know what, I could conform, but this is not me, like I want to self-express. So I know that you did well in school and the all your other sister do well in school as well? Did it conform to the, the expectations? They worked really, really hard. School was always 
uh, I guess, a little easier for me. I was really good at memorizing and, and regurgitating numbers and everything. Um, my other sisters had to work a bit harder, I think, but everyone strived to do well academically because, again, that was what was expected. And it's interesting what you share about the birth order and everything. Um, as the firstborn child, I was very committed to doing what I could to honor my parents and to listen to them. And I think I probably would have been a very different person if life had not had other plans for me. There was supposed to be a very strict path that you don't deter from, and this is just how life is, and you don't question it. And so I started questioning the, omni the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipower, like this all-powerful uh, nature of my parents when I was six. Um, when I was six, I was uh, sexually molested by a cousin, a family member in Hong Kong for an entire summer. And when I told my parents, they're like, oh, no, 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 we don't talk about this. And we never spoke about it. And I knew somewhere like on some level that that was not okay, that that was bad, that was wrong. And why couldn't my parents talk to me about it, support me in it? There was nothing. There was like a shutting down. So I think at that point there was like, a, okay, maybe your parents don't know everything. But I was so young, I was so small that this didn't really click. But there was always that point, just kind of like a maybe there's something more beyond their reality. And then so also growing up, my parents converted from Buddhism to Christianity. Mm. And to have a community in order to have, you know, just friends. They were approached by a Chinese Christian church and they were like, would you like to join the church? And so they're like, yes, people to spend time with, new friends, community, which we all need. So they became Christians. And we went to church every Sunday and I had like church, you know, friends and I would go to church camp, you know, in the summers. And I was a devout Christian. I wore a, a necklace with, you know, like Jesus on it. And I was like, maybe I'll go up and be a nun. Like I was like, I'm gonna be a virgin until marriage, like this whole plan, right? This is what my life will be. And when I was 18, I lost my virginity to a violent rape. And I called my parents sobbing after it happened. And my parents told me that I was a dirty slut and a whore who had shamed and disgraced the family, that they did not want me as part of the family and they disowned me. And so here I am, 18 years old, after a traumatic event, alone, 18 years old, alone, Gary, you know, it was just a space where, what do you do? And so at that point, I lost my trust and my faith in my parents. I lost my trust and my faith in an organized religion. Like, how could you do this to me, God? How could you let someone who devoted their whole life to you, who believes so much in you, how could this happen to someone who was just trying their best? How could you allow this sort of pain, this love, the suffering? And that opened up just a lot of space for questioning. Like, mm -hmm. wait everything that I have known to be true, that my parents know best for me, that this religion knows best for me, was pulled out from under me. Where do you go from there? And I, I went down a difficult path because we do our best with what we know. And at that point, I knew nothing. I knew how to cope. And so after a sexual trauma, um, survivors can become hyposexual or hypersexual. Hyposexual means you have zero interest in sex. You want to maybe gain weight so you so you don't attract any future sexual predators. Sometimes you develop a condition called vaginismus where your vagina closes up so tight you can't even get a Q-tip into it. On the other extreme, sometimes survivors of sexual violence become hypersexual. And that was the route I actually took because I believed that my virginity was the only thing that made me valuable. Now I was broken, now I was dirty. Why should I care about my body if no one else does, if God doesn't, if people won't because I'm not a virgin anymore. And so I started having very just unsafe, promiscuous sex because I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be loved. I wanted to be safe. And I sought it in very dangerous places. And so that was a part of my story that I own because it's made me who I am now. And there's been a lot of grace and forgiveness to that younger version of myself who was doing her best and didn't know how to take care of her, to protect herself, to even believe that she was worthy of protection at that time. So for most people, going through one of the sexual trauma, like at age of six, that's already like deep enough. I've seen a lot of people have very deep scars from their childhood. And you've got two very, very significant events. And not only that, having the parents not understanding what you were going through and reacted in such a manner, you must have spent a lot of time like 
doing some soul searching, like why me, why this, and how do you find your way back? Just keeping yourself sane and just having a, a life of normalcy. Normalcy is very relative, Gary. <laughs> mm. So for me, in terms of coming back to my family on one level, I'll go through several levels of this. Um, at one point, I had a friend, a uh, Vietnamese friend of mine, who was like, "Hey, if you want a relationship with your parents." you're going to have to go back and apologize to them. And this is after I've been homeless for several months after they disowned me. And I was like, wait a second, you want me like ask for forgiveness from them? You want me to apologize? He's like, in Asian culture, if you have done something to cause your family to lose face, even if it wasn't your fault, this is what will need to happen for you to have a relationship. I knew he was right. So he drove me back to my parents' house after I had not seen them and spoken to them for months. And I remember knocking on the door and I remember my mother opening the door and looking at me with her face cold, like, like I was a stranger. And she looked at me and she said, what do you want? And at that moment, this has never happened before. This has never happened since then, but my legs stopped working and I collapsed and I started sobbing and I started saying, I'm so sorry, mom, I'm so sorry. I just want to come home. Can I please just come home? And my mother looked at me and she goes, we will never speak of this again. And she turned around and was like, come inside. We're going to have dinner soon. And then it was never spoken of again until literally a few years ago. But that was how I reconnected with my family. And at that moment, I knew that my family would only accept me if I showed up a certain way and that there were things I would have to hide from them because they didn't have a capacity to see me as I was. And so something also shifted in me where I realized that I wasn't going to get what I needed from my parents, safety, love, acceptance, worthiness. And so I started looking for it externally. And for me, that showed up in the form of relationships. It became codependency. How can I find someone else to show me that I'm worthy, to show me that I'm lovable, to prove that I am worthy of taking up space as a human being? And if I find someone to love me and propose to me, and you mentioned earlier, part of my journey is I've been engaged five times, married once very briefly at a, at a Vegas drive through And in every single one of these relationships, there was, how can I get this person to love me? And to me, that meant becoming exactly who they wanted me to be. Oh, you like football and Mexican food? I love football and Mexican food. Gary, I don't like football or Mexican food. <laughs> I just, <laughs> but I did it. That meant I could be loved. And so I learned to chameleon, to become whatever other people wanted me to be so they would love me, so I'd have belonging, so I would be accepted, so that they would see me as someone who they needed or chose. But every single time I got another engagement ring, I felt empty. I felt disappointed. I felt resentful. And I was like, wait a second. How come I don't feel whole? How come this didn't fix the problem? How come this didn't make me feel worthy if this person's willing to spend their whole life with me? And so that, you know, who said Einstein, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. That's insanity. Yeah. That was me. I lived many years in a state of insanity where I was trying the same thing to get what I wanted and not getting it. And that was where one of my spiritual awakenings began when I just hit the wall and I was like, wait a second, this is not the answer. There's got to be something else. Wow. So normally when I've witnessed people awakening journey, what tends to happen is through a financial collapse, a relationship breakdown, health issues, like the ego of who the self-identity are, it gets collapsed in front of them. So not only do you have your whole Asian identity of who and, and Christian role model of how you're supposed to be that's collapsing in front of you, you've had five multiple occasions of almost like wearing a new suit, a new attire, a new ego, a new identity of who you are for the facade to keeping another person happy, like to get the shallow type of love, the transactional type of love back to you. But in those five occasions that the universe has shown you that, hey, this is not who you are. You always knew deep down, but it's almost like you needed to experience that you are more than the facade, that the colors that you show to the world deep down, like this is who you are. You've had to collapse so many times. That's crazy. That's not crazy, but that's like, what a ride. Like it must have been like a big roller coaster. So I want to ask, like, were you close to your sisters? Because obviously you confide in your parents to share this. Like, were you close to any of your siblings? Unfortunately, after my parents disowned me, they told my sisters, who were at a very impressionable age, I was 18, we're all three years apart. So my younger sisters were 15, 12, and 9, still living at home with my parents, still so young. And they told my siblings, 
Ivy's bad. You never want to be like Ivy. You know, we are disappointed in her. We're ashamed of her. You don't want to be like her. And so for a long time, there was distance between me and my sisters. They saw me as the bad one. And even when I was taken back into the family, there was a, an uncertainty there. There was a, who are you? We don't know you. And so there was a, a trust in my parents that they, my parents were right. And so it took a while. I reconnected with my sister, Irene. Um, who's number two. I'm number one, birth order. She's the second one. And she tried really hard to please my parents. She, for example, had always wanted to be an artist, so artistic, so talented, so gifted, so creative. My parents were like, art is stupid. Like, you will never make money as an artist and you're not smart enough to become a medical doctor, so become a pharmacist. This is literally what they told her. And so she, like a dutiful Asian daughter, gave up her dream of art and became a pharmacist. Long story short, by the way, hers is an amazing story. She totally have her on the podcast because right now she's phenomenal business making money as an artist after quitting her pharmacy job because wow. she had the courage to follow. So that's her story. I'll let her share it maybe at some point, but it's magic. I started to reconnect with my second sister when I, when I was working as a professional dominatrix. One of my clients actually gifted me um, an all expenses paid trip to Europe for a month after I graduated. And I asked my sister if she'd like to join me. And she was like, wait a second, how can you afford an all expenses paid trip to Europe for a month on the salary of a waitress? Because I told my parents I was paying my way through graduate school as a waitress. And that wasn't actually the case. I was working as a professional dominatrix. There's a whole story behind that. But nobody knew in my family. I was very much living a double life. And I had learned at this point to keep certain things from my family because I would not be able to be accepted, seen, loved if I showed them all of me. So my sister Irene went with me to Europe and I remember we were in a garden near the Louvre and I told her everything, just who I am, what's brought me here, what I'm actually doing to pay my way through graduate school. And she was curious. She responded not with judgment, but with curiosity. She was like, what is that? What do you mean a dominatrix? What does that involve? And so the fact that she could hear me, accept me and be curious to know more was so healing and such a safe space for me to land. And so we became very, very close after that trip. And I've been able to support her on her journey and she's been able to support me on mine. And I'm just so grateful to have her, uh, you know, truly is a soul sister on every level. Luckily enough, yeah. she's my biological sister too. So I, yeah. I, I think um, for the people that don't have the notion of what the professional dominatrix is, and as you call it, pro-dom, like I'm foreign to saying these words, um, but hearing some of the stars you've shared with me in the past, it's almost like it's a, you like started your own Airbnb equivalent. Like you created a thing <laughs> that there wasn't. It, when you go to college, when you go for an Asian path or non-Asian path, there isn't a de designated career to go into this line of work, but somehow you get a go on this but it's probably not what most people had imagined it's like just these working with some of your clients that just need deep healing work it's just nothing sexual it's just it, and I get it I get it from an entrepreneurial perspective why these um, people needed healing and why is they can get a kick from that um, but before that, I want to like get back to how do you change from a an attorney like going through that path to become a marriage and, and family therapist <laughs> So on the path of the law track, of course, to please my parents, I was in an environment where I was underneath fluorescent lighting, where I was constantly faxing, going through legal documents, and it was so draining for my soul and for my psyche. And I was offered the opportunity, I discovered an opportunity to volunteer for the suicide prevention hotline. And I underwent the training for that. And then for five hours a week, I waited for calls, you know, with a group of other volunteers for people who called the suicide prevention hotline to essentially speak to them in one of the darkest points of their lives. And so we did a suicidal assessment. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Do you, what's your plan? Do you have the means? When are you going to do it? You know, we learned all of this. And so we would basically talk to people and help them find something to live for. And this was what I looked forward to most. I would go through the office work and then I would look forward to my five hours of volunteer work on this hotline. And after a while, I realized that there's so much pain and suffering in the world. If I can do something about it, I want to be able to help alleviate it however I can. And so that's why I decided to, to make the leap, to make the shift, to pivot from law 
to psychotherapy. And that was a really scary leap. And I had to start from scratch, you know, just applying to school, starting all over again. My parents completely revoked any and all financial support, which is why I ended up becoming a professional dominatrix um, through a series of strange and serendipitous events. But that's what resulted in that shift. There was just so much satisfaction, fulfillment, and just purpose in the work of of supporting people through their pain. Yeah, it sounded like that's part of your sole purpose. You just find your home, like despite that, it's just being a volunteering gig um, to just being the highlight. Like you're not just a giver, but I think deep down you dare to guide other souls like back home and, and that's a easier path. And again, like I, I relate back to the Jesus story, like he has to go through the extreme so that other people don't have to. And I really honor you for um, having the courage to not give up and just one obstacle after the other and just you know what, I'll go through it, I'll go through it. And so that we can find our way by following some of the journey that you've been. And I'd also like to say, like, to some extent, there's the going through the fire and the flames, so others don't have to, and so that others going through the fire and the flames can find their way out, knowing that they're going to be okay through it, you know, being able to yeah. hold someone's hand through the fire, because you've been there too. Yeah, and, and sometimes you have to go through the fight to become the phoenix that you're born to be. Exactly, 100%. Mm-hmm. Mm. So um, the family therapist work, I guess maybe you were studying and it wasn't paying enough. That's how you got somehow got into pro-dom work? Well, not quite. <laughs> so how I ended up as a pro-dom was I got into um, grad school at the University of Southern California, USC, which is not a cheap school to go to. And so I applied for loans and I'd never applied for school loans before I'd gotten scholarships and everything in the past. And so, you know, approved for a loan, but I didn't realize that with loan money, you get half each semester. I thought you got the whole lump sum at once. I was wrong. So basically it's about a month before school begins and I don't have enough loan money to pay the full amount. I need to make, I'm five figures short. (laughs) And so I emailed everyone I knew and I was like, okay, look, I want to go to school this year. I want to start this fall. I have a month to make this amount help. How do I do it? I'm willing to tell me what to do and I'll do it. I just don't want to take off my clothes. I don't want to have sex for money. I don't want to sell drugs, like nothing illegal, please. (laughs) Like, but anything else I will consider. And most people my age at that point were like, good luck with that. (laughs) Like, if you figure it out, I'd love to know. But one person who was a former psychology professor of mine actually reached out and was like, I have someone that you may be interested in meeting. And if she accepts you as her apprentice, she could be your mentor. And I'd never had a mentor before. I'd never been an apprentice. I was like, what is it? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you. Why don't you just go talk to her and see if it resonates? And so out of curiosity, I I contacted her, I drove to her, you know, beautiful one, you know, story home in West Los Angeles with a white picket fence around it. And she sat down, interviewed me. And at the end of the hour, she was like, okay, I think you have what it takes to do this work. I will train you. And I was like, train me in what? Like at this point, I still didn't know. And that's when she led me down this long hallway towards the white door that opened into a dungeon. And I was like, oh no, (laughs) Uh, I don't think this is what I actually want. Like, I think that there's been a mistake. I'm not interested in having sex for money. And she looked at me and she was like, as a professional dominatrix, you'll never have sex for money. She's like, just like professional therapy never involves sex, professional domination never involves sex. And then I was confused. I was like, well, then what what does this involve? Like, I don't want to take off my clothes. And she's like, oh, no, 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 you will never take off your clothes. And she opens up this closet and she's like, it's Halloween every day. And so she showed me these like beautiful leather, latex outfits, boots, corsets. And I'm like, what is this? I like dressing up. And so I'm like, well, I don't want to touch anyone's genitalia. And she was like, oh, don't worry. You will never touch anyone's genitals unless you're kicking in the balls. And then I will teach you how to do that without doing any permanent damage. And at this point, I was like, I don't understand this world. Like, what is this? And I was intrigued and fascinated because, I mean, I'm interested in psychology. What, why do people do what they do, want what they want, what makes them tick? And I was really drawn to the world of pro-domination that I discovered it to be because you are a professional who is paid to create and protect a safe, judgment-free space for people to be all of who they are. And what a beautiful parallel to therapy and to healing. Do you know what is the history? Like, how was that founded, pro-domination? 
It's been around for a while. <laughs> People have always had kinks and fetishes and basically parts of themselves that they were ashamed of. And so whenever there's a demand and there will be uh, someone who rises to meet that demand. And so mm -hmm. if there's a demand for someone to allow you to express who you are as a cross-dresser, as someone who is a foot fetish, as someone who is a masochist, there will be someone who's like, okay, well, I will create a space where you can experience, express, and be fully embodied as this part of who you are without shaming you for it wow. and celebrating you. Wow. Like, I, I remember, what is Alison Armstrong or David Data or a combination of both? Like, normally people in the intimate relationship, they'll have either, they put on a certain archetype of the light, uh, which I'm the goody-goody or, or the dark. But to get the most of the, the relationship, the polarity and the sexual energy, if you can play both roles of, of the light and the dark in the change between the two, I think like one of the David Data's workshop, they asked women what are some of the fantasies and a lot of them are wanting to, um, I don't want to frame it the wrong way, but rape of some sorts, but not because they want to be raped, but, but wanting a guy to really take control of them and not having to think, uh, I guess, in a sense. And yet the the white, the pure angel type of archetype is great, but sometimes it's a bit plain. It, it, you don't have the darkness to it. So we in, in our certain paradigm think that darkness is bad, but in this form of dark, is there another flavor of healing for the client that you were serving, it, it seems? Like, so what would a typical client like? What circumstances would they be going through to seek healing in through the, the pro dom work? I love the polarity of this. There's such catharsis and freedom in surrender, in letting go. So often in life, we have roles and responsibilities, things that we have to do as a parent, as a CEO, as a you know, friend, as a daughter, as a son, you know, just all of these roles and responsibilities that we have to play. And to be able to be free of all of that, to be literally stripped down to the core of who you are and to be allowed to play in a space where you can be tied up and be so free in that space because in being tied up, you can let go. I had a client who would come in and who I would bind so tightly, he couldn't even move his fingers and he would be wrapped in a leather body bag, you know, with like tied down with ropes, encased in leather, and then he would sleep, Gary. He wow. would fall asleep for three, four hours. And he said, literally, I have to be tied down to the point where I cannot look at my phone. I cannot answer emails. I cannot take calls. I cannot be sealing deals. I literally am forced to stop, to slow down, and then my body, my nervous system, my soul, my spirit can rest, deeply rest. Wow. I remember like with one of my ex-girlfriend, she's pretty much like what I wanted. She would be whether it's a chameleon or she's quite adaptive to what I want. So you can say that she's giving me everything that I was after. But at the same time, I was running my business and it's quite straining mentally to always having to think. So when I went home and, hey, let's go out for dinner. Like, where do you want to go? She would say that, well, where do you want to go? And it's like, ah. <laughs> More decisions. I've already made so many. Exactly, Gary. A hundred percent. You have to make so many decisions as a CEO, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. And in the dungeon, you are allowed to make none. You are responsible for zero decisions. <laughs> like you are literally guided, led, supported, and it's very clear what the path is, and you can just be. And yet, uh, as I knew that that wasn't what I wanted deep down, so I attracted my wife. And in the current relationship, the time that she's taking charge, I'm not recognizing that freedom to allowing myself to be. And I'm fighting again. The ego is like, that's not what I want. And But when you can recognize the gift is that your soul doesn't want to be in charge all the time, nor does my wife want to be in charge all the time as well. I have the perfect yin and the yang and the polarity. But when I fail to recognize, I want to tip the balance and become imbalanced. That's when we're going to have conflict. Mm. It's interesting because there are times in relationships where we will need to submit or to yield. And there are times when it's a relief to. And there are times when the ego is like, no, I want to hold on to this. You know, like there are so many different dynamics. And in the context of loving BDSM, 
There is allowing you to be as you are and allowing me to be as I am and seeing what arises in this space with a very safe container of boundaries, of consent. It, it, there's clarity. Instead of having to guess where someone's at, this is what's expected. This is what's expected. And then you have freedom to play in that space and to see what comes up. And really, on such a small level, the invitation to surrender and to let go in a dungeon is an invitation to surrender and let go to life. And to trust that you will be held, you will be carried, you will be kept safe wherever you are led. Wow. So the first time you had a client, I assume your mentor wasn't there? <laughs> yes. So first, I, I actually started out watching sessions to see if it was okay. something I wanted to do. So I sat in on, I got paid $50 an hour just to watch. <laughs> and I was like, uh -huh. people pay $50 just to sit in the room. She's like, yes, trust me, it's great for you to be there. Just be yourself. So I'd be like, oh, or like laugh or whatever. And I was fascinated. And so in my first few sessions, she was with me. She was there supporting me. We called them, you know, double dominatrix sessions, double dom sessions. And so she would be there to help me, support me, guide me, uh, play off each other's energy. And I'm so grateful for her guidance and for her experience and showing me the techniques and the tools and the tips and also um, the psychology behind it. That was really important to be able to understand, to be able to take care of those who trusted us. Wow, I just had another vision. It's almost like you are a character in Star Wars. Um, one <laughs> of the, was it Ray? But you've learned from the, the, the light energy and the dark energy as well. You've got both crafts and which she was the, from a lineage of the dark energy. So she's always had it. And that must give you a lot of tools to use when you're um, doing your healing work, your counseling work, your therapy work with people. And I, I know that you've also talked about you help people healing their ancestral trauma and their lineage and, and a lot of deep, deep, deep soul um, uh, traumatic events that people have come to you with help on. Mm -hmm. Why do you shift away from the pro-dom work? Because you go on crazy adventures and going to Europe for a month and here earning good money and you getting the soul filled up because you are healing people. You're giving them a therapeutic release that normally they wouldn't get that sense of peace and calmness during the session. So what made you change your craft? So I worked as a professional dominatrix in the scene for 14 years. And that's a long time <laughs> to be in any profession. And for me, it was so interesting and dynamic and fascinating. There's so much room for growth. But there was a point that I reached. Um, like you said, I was traveling the world. I had clients everywhere from Singapore, New York, L.A., uh, D.C., London, just Madrid, Paris, literally everywhere. And I remember... I was in Barcelona eating dinner by myself at this beautiful, you know, three Michelin star rated restaurant by myself. And then I went back to my Airbnb afterwards, uploaded some pictures on a Facebook and then sat there for hours just refreshing to see who liked it, who commented on it. I was living this life that seemed so glamorous, but I was also really lonely it was hard to stay connected to with and create deep ties to community, to relationships when I was traveling everywhere all the time. And at that point, I've been in this work for 14 years. For many, many years, if you typed Asian dominatrix into Google, I would be the number one hit. And so I was training other doms, was speaking, teaching, and also felt a bit of dissonance because I was not out. And the people who I loved most and who I was closest to, my, my family, didn't know, right? And so there was a, a desire to go from the shadow into the light and to see what I could do in that space. You cannot have one without the other. And so there was a starting from scratch again, you know, like the month before I quit cold turkey, I'd made like 35K. And the year after I quit, I made nothing, Gary. I made zero dollars. So even though there was no sex in my work as a poor dominatrix, it's under the sex work umbrella. 
And I feel like sex work is the only work where you can be like, hi, I'm brand new to this world. I have no experience. I don't know what I'm doing. And people will be pounding down your door trying to like book an appointment. As a therapist, I'm like, hello, I'm a therapist. I have no online presence. I really have nothing, you know, to show for my years of licensure. Guess how many people came knocking down my door? Nobody. Huh. And so that was when I was like, huh, I'm going to have to start from scratch. And so that was the beginning of a whole new adventure. And that was four years ago. Ah, Was it the time that you started going snowboarding and traveling around the world? I did a lot of snowboarding and traveling around the world, Gary. <laughs> one stop. I um, remember yeah. there was one year plotting the various location you're going to be at this place. But that's probably like not long after I met you that there was more. I just happened to see the post. So that's probably been your lifestyle, just adventuring and experiencing the world. So after I met you, after the Awesomeness Fest, at one point soon after that, I flew to Necker. I was on Necker for a, a few days. Then I flew to go snowboarding in Chamonix. And then from there, I flew to Morocco to go, you know, like through the Sahara Desert, you know, go ride camels in the desert and sleep with a nomadic family beneath the stars. And after that, I flew to Barcelona. You know, so this was probably around that time. You know, this was my life. Yeah. So... You just glanced over that, like, you got to meet some um, incredible, um, what people say is the celebrities, um, influencers, like Necker Island, if you don't know, is this Richard Branson's island, and there's an infamous picture of you, like, when Richard Branson is jet skiing you on his back, but you, when you talk about it, it's just so you as a character, you're not attached, you're not using it to name drop, to to elevate yourself to you. Everyone is the same, like whether it's the, a random postman that you meet or uh, someone that's really, really famous. Um, so do you want to share a little bit about your adventure on, on how you, I don't know, like, like meeting some of these people, did it make you become fuller, wiser, or was it just another part of the journey? I'm at a point in my life where if I can't feel you, I'm not interested in getting to know you. So in so much of the celebrity world, even the personal growth world, you know, the celebrities of the personal growth world who I know have met, have been in relationships with, if you are not congruent with your message, if you are not living in a way that is fully connected and in deep alignment with your deepest integrity and highest and greatest truth, I can feel the dissonance. I can feel the misalignment. And at the end of the day, if I want to know who you are, how you're showing up in the world, what work you are doing to continue to more deeply know, heal, grow, thrive, and I'm here to support you in that. I'm here to love you in that. And I think that I dated someone who was considered a celebrity for a while and he was telling me, you know, like every time you put out a new book, album, movie, whatever it happens to be, you are subjected to judgment. And for so many people who have become famous, there is a drive to get love and validation on a massive scale from a lot of people, you know, even people in the personal growth world. I'm here so I can get filled through this power, through this influence, through this, you know, all the things that come along with power and fame. And I found that for a lot of them, there's a lot of loneliness. There's a lot of disconnect. There's a lot of anxiety. I have to keep performing. And there is a pain there that I can relate to, that I experienced, you know, myself and in, in a different way, you know? And, and so again, it doesn't matter how many zeros in your bank account. I care about the richness of your soul, of your heart, of your desire to be more of who you are and to do the work to free yourself from the beliefs that you may have lived your entire life that may no longer be in your highest and greatest good. And yeah. so, yeah, that That's answers beautiful. that question. I think I, I learned it from somewhere. Somebody said that when they read the energy in the room, I'm not that sensitive to read energy in the room, but if certain speakers in the personal development world or wherever they are teaching you like all these seemingly like great uh, wisdom tools to use, but there is, it's mainly the ego is driving them and, and they're craving those attention, that person will suck energy from the room for himself or herself. Conversely, if someone is truly in alignment and serving from the soul and they're already filled up, they'll give energy to the room. 
And I think like what you refer to in relationship is kind of the same as well. If unless you already filled up yourself, you need someone to validate you, to give you something from the archetype of the Disney movie. You need to be a princess, a prince. You need all this external stuff to fill you up. You need a certain person to validate who you are. Then you never win because you always have a leaking bucket that always leaks out. So with your five engagement and numerous relationship and going the highs and lows and then doing a lot of the therapy work, tell me about what have you learned about um, intimate relationships? Mm, one of the biggest things I've learned about intimate relationships is that you can only give and receive as much love to and from others as you are able to give and receive to and from yourself. So let me unpack a little. So historically, like before I was starting to wake up to a lot of this, if I'm already happy, and back then when I thought happy, I was still working in a broken child syndrome. I thought it's the, the external stuff that's making me happy. So I'm happy. Let's find someone else that would amplify my level of happiness. I can share it with other people. But then I've never had a sister before. I've never grown up with um, females around me. And from that standpoint, even my grandma that I grew up with since I was 12, she was very, quite masculine as well. And still very loving, but very masculine. Um, so I didn't know about like how female is not just a, a hairy version or a non-hairy version of a male. Um, we have some challenges, moments to get to understand when female is going through the emotional waves. I was thinking, hey, you should just like be logical like a man <laughs> i didn't frame it as a man but like i didn't understand but going through the journey was i loving myself well i thought i was but i was still craving the validation so i didn't completely own myself okay is that what you're referring to mm. when you think that you have to be a certain way to be loved and then yeah. when you limit yourself or hold back or make yourself small or deny yourself parts of who you are in order to be loved, depriving yourself, abandoning of yourself. And if you abandon yourself to try and get love, then you will only be able to receive so much love. You know, in the moment that you refuse to abandon yourself any longer, the moment that you decide to show up as all of who you are, then and only then can other people who have been looking for all of you find you and love you the uh. way you are in your fullness. So what happens if you're in a relationship that if you do certain things that tends to tick the other person off, like, I don't know, for example, um, you leave your socks a certain way, your shoes a certain way, or not putting the toilet seat up or down. Um, are you referring to stuff like that, that not being yourself, or is it speaking your mind beyond the, the small stuff that doesn't matter? What do you mean by being yourself? Uh, what I mean by that is, by the way, if you're in a relationship with someone, there are going to be things that annoy you, irritate you, bother you. And this, what a beautiful way to have an experience of seeing more mirrored back to you. But what I'm talking about in terms of allowing more of yourself to be seen, speaking up, like you said, sharing more about your emotions, how you feel about something, if you disagree about something, if you're feeling scared about something, you know, like I think for a lot of men, they're expected to be brave and courageous and not show weakness, not show, you know, I have never seen my own father cry. And I know that there's a lot of pain there. And so I wish that he would show me a part of him that was vulnerable or that was scared or that was sad so I could love that part of him. And if he doesn't show it, then I won't ever be able to love it and to show him that I love him more because of it. You know, so, so many times we hold things back in shame, parts of who we are, parts of our story, whatever we're feeling, whatever we experience, whatever we have done in the past, because we're afraid that people will judge us, push us away, reject us but really it prevents them from being able to know us more and love us more in that way. So I guess the, the key to going to, into a relationship is to communicate your feelings and just be transparent and speaking your mind? Be more and more of who you are. So obviously when you first meet someone, there's you take time to get to know someone. Let people teach you who they are. Show up as you and listen and learn and learn who the other person is. And if you start to learn that they are a person who you can trust, who you feel safe with, then and only then can you open up more and more about your story, who you are, what is vulnerable and scary for you to share. How do they respond? Do they respond with judgment, criticism, shutting you down, minimizing your pain? Do they sit with you? Do they love you? Do they hold you? Do they ask you what you need? 
do they let you know that they see you, that they love you, and that they honor you even more for it? And if they respond with uh, criticism and judgment, then what do you do? So there are times in my past where people responded with criticism, judgment, and shame of who I was, and I stayed with them, and I tried to convince them to love me because I was repeating a very old pattern of trying to get love from someone who can't see me. You know, for much of my childhood, my parents were unable to see me. And so I chose, we repeat patterns until we decide we're done with them, until we have the awareness to stop. So I kept choosing people who reminded me of my historical parents, who growing up were critical, were judgmental. And I thought I had to perform, to do more, to be more, to earn their love. You don't need to earn love. You can show up as yourself and choose to love, and people can choose to love you, or they may not. And you should never have to try and force or convince someone to love you. Because if they can't, that's okay. There's someone out there who will be able to. And you can always fall into the safety and protection of your own arms. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean to be someone else's. And so when you reach that point, you will start attracting very different people. So in doing the healing work myself, I've stopped being attracted to people who can't see me, can't love me, criticize me. I'm like, bye, <laughs> that doesn't work for me. And now I'm attracting incredible humans into my life, friends and otherwise, who are just loving and who want to know more of me so that they can love more of me. So you've been doing a lot of work on codependency. Can you mm -hmm. share a bit more light on that? Sure. Yeah. Codependency is known as the disease to please. Mm. So codependency is where you try and make everyone around you happy. You try and do everything for everyone, even at the expense of yourself, to the point where it becomes more harmful than helpful. And so it's a beautiful character trait to want to make people happy, to want to support others in their dreams, to want to give to others. But there becomes a point where it becomes more harmful if you are abandoning yourself, if you are suffering, if you are not taking care of yourself, if you are putting their needs before your own. That's when it becomes codependency, when you become drained as a result of it and bitter and angry and frustrated and resentful and then continue to do what you're doing because you're hoping that they will give back and they're not. And then you give and give and give and give. So that work. And so the healing of codependency involves boundary setting, learning to say no, learning to take care of yourself, learning to recognize your wants and then to have them met. Yeah, setting boundaries is a big thing. Like when I was going reading through a lot of relationship books for men, it talks about setting healthy boundaries. And even with kids as well, like boundaries is, is one of the things is not like, hey, like for me to going through this, I'm independent, like I just collapse my ego just take whatever but at the same time it's not being hey like i just do what i want and if you don't like it like get out like it's not like being like that at all it's just having healthy boundaries to live in uh, harmoniously and i i always remember this quote from taoism like tao Te Ching. it talks about somewhere in, in the context of if everyone have freedom nobody have freedom because when everyone have freedom somebody can come to your house and steal your stuff mm -hmm, <laughs> they're free exactly. to do so Yep. Nobody has it. So in 8 billion people on this planet, if we all want to be more free, in a sense that we still have to respect everyone's boundaries and, and what they will accept and what they like and what they don't like. Absolutely. And you have to know what they are if other people are going to be able to honor them. And you have to be able and willing to set them. You know, like you said, with children, children need boundaries. They thrive with boundaries. So do relationships. So does, you know, your BDSM, you know, relation like work, right? Like there's boundaries in everything. Boundaries in all relationships will help them thrive because then you're protecting yourself. You know where you end and someone else begins and joyfully connect in that space. But the boundaries are essential. Huh, you just gave me an aha moment. Since we're playing this game of life, in any games, you need a set of rules to play within. And sometimes you forget what those rules are and you need to be reminded. Um, but without those rules, you don't know how to win. You don't know whether you're going well. You don't know whether you're going off course or not. And very often with our loved ones and even with our friends as well, we haven't created those rules or we haven't made those rules known to other people. And when people are infringing on those rules, we get pissed off sometimes in silence and sometimes explicitly um, showing them that we're not happy, but yet we haven't really 
explain to them what our personal rules of this game if you want to be in a relationship with myself mm -hmm. mm. exactly a hundred percent and again this is part of healthy and loving communication right people cannot read your mind people are not mind readers they're not going to know what your boundaries are they're not going to know what the rules of your game are you have to tell them and it's always loving to share boundaries with someone because it teaches someone how to love you better how to interact with you in a more caring way do you have a resources that you can share um, or books or, or something um, that could give people more examples of how to set back healthy boundaries? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can share a whole list with you afterwards and you can provide them to people who are listening. I have a number of resources because this is one of the most important skills that we can learn in this lifetime, setting boundaries, being able to identify and set them. So I'll send you a list. Cool. While well, we got you on this podcast for the benefits of the listener, in relationship, what are some of the key boundaries or good examples of boundaries is useful to have? So these are going to vary for everyone. But for example, you need to have your non-negotiable boundaries, right? So one non-negotiable boundary is no one is allowed to physically hit me, right? Like no one is allowed to scream at me. And so those are some very basic boundaries where if someone starts to scream at me, like I actually had to use this with my own parents. You know, my parents used to scream at me and call me names. I, I told them, hey, I love you and I want to have a relationship with you and I want to communicate and connect with you. And I will not accept being screamed at. If you're going to scream at me, I'm going to end the conversation and we can't speak again for a while. And so I didn't speak to my parents for a while because every time it would be like, you know, you stupid idiot. I'm like, uh-uh, nope, I do not accept that. That's not okay. And over time, you have to teach people how to treat you. Over time, my parents realized I was serious. I was not going to talk to them if they spoke to me in a way that was cruel and harsh and unkind. And so our relationship changed where they learned to speak in a more kind and loving way to me, where they learned that if they raised their voice and started screaming, I would leave. And so now we have the best relationship we've ever had ever, Gary. It's so beautiful how our relationship is healed. But if I did not set those boundaries, I would still be suffering and struggling. Wow, that's a really great example. Thank you for sharing that, Ivy. Mm -hmm. I I remember it's almost like running a business. They say what you um, what you tolerate is what the result that you're going to get. So if, if people are underperforming on certain KPIs and, and you let it go or you don't pull them up, you don't comment on it, then how do people know what your expectation is or whether your expectations are real? Because your communication of what's real from their personal upbringing, some, their parents could have said something, you need to get great A's. And if you don't, we're going to have certain consequences. But those consequences was never follow through. So they just could mm -hmm. perceive that you told them certain things is going to happen. It could be exactly the same way. So, um, wow, what a beautiful example. Do you have a few more examples you can share? Of yeah. um, healthy boundaries. And by the way, I mean, again, boundaries and business as well. You will teach other people how to treat you and your business. You'll teach your employees how to treat, you know, you and the business. You'll teach uh, business partners, colleagues, customers, you know. So, again, boundaries, 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 boundaries. Um, interpersonal relationships. So um, another boundary is the personal boundaries. Don't speak for that way. I won't accept this. Um, don't comment on my uh, weight for, for some people, it's like, uh, I don't want you to comment on my weight. That's a boundary. Please don't speak to me like that. A boundary is basically protection for you. So if someone is doing something that hurts you, that's not okay, that doesn't resonate, you have to protect yourself with that boundary. Um, a boundary could be as small as, um, hey, I need your help this weekend moving, you know? So if you were super codependent to want to make people happy, even if you had other things to get done this week, you'd be like, yeah, no problem. And you would be like, I will devote my whole weekend to helping you move. A boundary could be, hey, you know, I've got some stuff going on, but I can come by for an hour on Sunday. Let me know when that would be, right? And so the boundary is, no, I cannot help you the whole weekend, but I'm willing to see you for an hour on Sunday and help you unpack stuff or whatever. I mean, boundaries can be flexible as well. So it's really important to get really clear about what you need first and foremost, you get comfortable setting them. And then different circumstances may allow you to be a little softer with them. Boundaries are not walls, they're doors, right? Wow. So there's a boundary there, but you can choose to let some people in and not others. Yeah, good. I was going to say that like people may have the perception that boundaries are 
you're keeping yourself isolated and boxed out of other people and you, you're trying to disconnect from other people. But in other sense, it's like we all want our me time every so often. So if you're meditating, you don't want everyone like screaming and partying around you. So by having a door, having a room, which is the equivalent of boundaries, it allows you to do certain things that you want to, whether it's to meditate, whether it's to play piano or to do your work. It's the equivalent that you've got a door that if you need to come in, you knock before. And if I'm available, they will let you come in. A hundred percent. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, on the deeper side of people afraid to calling on the boundaries are the validation needing to self-acceptance from, well, not self-acceptance, acceptance from the external. So Tony Robbins talks a lot about that the human's greatest fear is that if I'm not enough, I will not be loved. So we're all craving for other people's love. Um, How do you discover or how do you help um, people discover their self-love? So just like you have to teach other people to love you, you have to teach yourself what you deserve and how you show up for yourself. So you teach yourself that you are worthy of protection by protecting yourself with boundaries. You teach yourself that you're worthy of love by treating yourself lovingly, by speaking to yourself kindly. We all can have a very loud inner critic that's judgmental and you should have done it this way and you should have done it better. And you wouldn't talk to anyone else like that. But you talk to yourself like that. So noticing, wait, whose voice is that? And what is my truest voice? And what is the kindest thing? Like, how do I actually want to speak to myself? How do I want to treat myself? What do I protect time and space for? Do I make time and space to take care of myself, to give myself what I need? Am I taking care of my body physically? Am I giving myself nourishment? Am I giving myself movement? Am I giving myself what I need spiritually? Am I giving myself what I need And even recognizing, first of all, that you are worthy of having those needs and having those wants and inviting you to meet them first, really getting to know yourself. And in codependency, there's other people define you. Other people tell you who you are and what you like and what you want. You mentioned you had an ex-girlfriend who was like, whatever you want for dinner, you know, and and at such a small level, it's like, "I, I, whatever you want. And it's like, wait, you're allowed to have wants too from your favorite foods to activities to how you want to spend your time to how much me time you need. And if you don't know what you want, you're not going to be able to get it from anyone else, much less yourself. So one of the first steps is to realizing that you are deserving of having wants and having needs. Again, in codependency, you become needless and wantless, whatever other people want and need first. For you, what do you want? What do you need? What makes your soul feel nourished? What makes you feel connected and safe? and giving yourself those things first. Because it can be through a process of journaling to better more, better understand yourself. This can be healing through meditation. This can be seeking out spaces where you feel seen and allowing yourself to receive love and support from yourself first and then from others. Wow. I remember reading a book. I forgot what is the art of love or something. It talks about in the ancient Toltec traditions, what relationship and love is. Um, if we need love from someone else, then we will never find it um, because that's not real love. And I guess in the relationship, in the marriage, in the society um, programming that we've got is love comes from the external. Love comes from Valentine's Day, people buying us certain things, taking us to date nights and dinners and stuff. If they don't do that, we don't have love from the other person. Um, so how do you see like marriage and long-term relationship that that's in, in framing in that manner that the, the other person is supposed to do certain things and behave a certain way to bring you happiness mm-hmm. and love? It is not anyone else's job to make you happy. It is not anyone else's job to make you feel loved. That is your job first and foremost. And so the deepest human need is not to be loved necessarily, because we can love someone and not want to spend that much time around them. The deepest human need is actually to be seen, to be known, to be accepted as you are, to be loved as you are, but to be seen first. And so one of the greatest gifts that you could give yourself and your partner in a long-term loving relationship is the opportunity to more deeply know you. And so there's an exercise I actually give to the couples I work with that I'm going to offer you, you know, to try with your wife and anyone else who's listening. So this is called an emotional intimacy exercise. You can do it at any point in time. I know couples who do it once per day, sometimes once per week. But you basically sit with your partner and you agree that in this space, you each take a turn, 
no talking over each other. The point of this exercise is not to fix, to change, to criticize, to heat, you know, it's to be seen. And so it's very simple. You each take a turn sharing. One time this week I felt happy was when blank. One time this week I felt sad was blank. One time this week I felt afraid was blank. One time this, so you basically share times this week or this day or this lifetime, you know, that I felt this emotion and you let yourself be seen. You get to express and to be witnessed as you are. I felt really scared when I heard about, you know, that thing on the news. I felt really angry when I didn't, when this didn't come through for me. I felt really heartbroken when this, I felt really excited when I saw the kids do this, you know, you just get to know your partner more deeply, more beautifully, more vulnerably, more authentically. And in being seen and in being able to see your partner, you're able to deepen your connection, your intimacy, your vulnerability, your love, your knowing of each other. And what a gift to be able to allow yourself to be seen and to see the one that you love. Wow, what a great exercise, because for the person that's sharing it, especially if it's anything negative, you get to release it by externally communicating it. And if it's something joyful, you get to amplify it by spreading that as well. And the person that's listening on it and seeing the other person, like what you said with your dad, like if sometimes that we put on a facade, a, a wall that we block it out or we try to dissolve the stuff and or just swallow it, but when you release it out, thinking it's a negative thing, but actually it can deepen the connection. It allows space for other person who comes in. And I know that there are times that when the other partner is so strong, so independent, there's nothing I need. There's no room for the other person to come into care. And the care that you talk about, artificial care, hey, do you want to go for dinner and stuff? Is it really stuff that you need? Maybe on a superficial level, but it's not on the soul level that, that you crave for. So even when they meet that, it's very shallow. Um, in my earlier developments, I used to look at books like from Dr. Field, The Sixth Love Language, and all those books are like men are from Mars, women are from Venus. All those books have a place in your personal evolution. But I find that you can do all that, but if you don't have the self-love that you're talking about, if you still have the codependency of needing other people to validate you, nothing works. I remember there was like 51 days in a row I used to buy my wife gifts because it's her love language, but it lacks any punch. Because it was coming from a place of lack and scarcity. I hope that she's happy with it. I hope that she'll love me as a result of buying her these mm -hmm. gifts. But mm -hmm. I haven't loved myself fully yet. So what is the best place for people to enter a relationship? Because very often um, when we, at least in our age growing up, we didn't find ourselves until like we're 30 or 40s or sometimes 50s. Mm -hmm. So typically in this current model of the world, people would get married in the 20s or early 30s and they have kids. But if we can't find ourselves and have the self-love that we desire until the later age, how are they supposed to enter a relationship or at least a long-term relationship in their earlier years? There's no right or wrong way to do anything, right? So I believe life will always rise to support you no matter what decision it is that you make. So trusting that. There's no, again, right, wrong, good, bad decision. There's only decision that is. And so for people who get married very, very young, anything is possible. You can absolutely grow together. And then there are some couples as well where one person's really into personal growth, development, awareness, insight, and they grow and the other person has no interest in that. And then can you accept and be with and love each other as you are? Or does your soul need more? You know, there are so many things that come up in the space of a relationship, a partnership, an evolution together. And so communicate, communicate, communicate. Be really honest about where you are, what you're feeling, having the courage to speak, even if it is an uncomfortable, challenging conversation. If it's your truth then allow the person that you're with to get to know you more. And how do they respond? And can you identify and share what you need, what you're hoping for, what your dreams are? And can they be supported? And can they be met? And can they at least be understood by your partner? And is that enough? 
You know, there's so many layers to this and everyone's path is different. You're bringing together different individuals from different backgrounds, different histories, different needs, different lineages. And how do you navigate this new world, this new terrain of partnership together? And I really recommend um, continuing to do the work through, you know, there's couples therapy, there's coaching, there's all sorts of programs you can do as a couple to more deeply strengthen your bond to help you more deeply know and love each other and understand each other and support each other. And we do the best we can with what we know. And that's why it's so helpful to have support from different sources because there are different people who are at different points along the path who provide incredibly valuable insight, knowledge, and again, tools and tips to help you along the way. We're all in this together and we're not meant to walk this journey alone. So there are there is support out there. Are you open to exploring that? And receiving that sure so uh, that's a good segue i was going to ask for people that's having a, a difficult time in an re- intimate relationship right now they're having disconnect and tension conflict and in fact some of them are thinking of where they're staying to going aside from reaching out to you which i'll get you to share your contact details at the end of this uh, podcast and I'll, I'll leave in the show notes assuming if people haven't been able to access you because of your long waiting list then what are some of the advice and wisdom you can share with them on how to navigate this path where there's to stay where to go what are some of the things that they can do right now so especially with everything happening during this current pandemic, there are couples that are navigating completely new territory who have had to spend maybe more time together in this close proximity than ever before. And it's bringing up a lot and it can be very confronting. And so there are many things that you can do on an individual level. There is the invitation to do your own work first. So if you are really triggered, this is bringing up old stuff, if you find yourself falling into old patterns, which is very common, and, you know, just give yourself compassion and grace because what's happening right now is a lot. Can you get your own support? Are you feeling full or are you empty? Are you running on empty? And if you're running on empty, where are you not taking care of yourself? If you're finding yourself very snappy, you know, I, I use the acronym HALT a lot with my clients, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. If you're hungry, if you're angry, if you're lonely, if you're tired, don't try and have any sort of conversation with anybody. Take care of your needs first, right? Like these are like, so let's just set ourselves up for success as much as possible. Because if you go in with one of those things, it just likely won't end well. And so take care of yourself first. And if you are depending your partner to meet your needs when they're not even able to take care of their own needs, that's when you have to fill your own cup first. So first, do your own work, get your own support, get your own therapy, reach out to your own network. What is going on with you and what do you need? And once you can identify what you need, then you can go to your partner. Hey, I wonder if we can work on this together. I I wonder if I can have your support. I'm wondering if we can come together as a team and explore this possibility. So then you can have that conversation. If your partner is able and willing and has that energy to, great. And if not, you're going to have to respect that boundary on them and keep taking care of you. And so... It, if you're at a point where it's truly, should I stay or should I go? That's a pretty advanced point. And there's been a lot that hasn't been met to have gotten to that point. And mm-hmm. so there are many different things you can do at this point. There's always the work that you can do to repair. And then sometimes I say there's so much crap in the toilet, you just got to like buy a new one. You know, like you just, there's too much, like, and sometimes it's just too much. And I've worked with couples where there's been a realization, like it's too much and I'm not willing to do the work and it's time to lovingly let you go. And there's a, let's do the work. I know it'll be a lot, but we're both in it together. So let's do that. But I think like you propose a really strong notion that either way, you're moving away a lot more at peace, maybe not completely in peace, but a lot more at peace versus like, Uh, reacting to the fight or flight tendency there's how much are you abandoning yourself right because again so many times in relationships we abandon ourselves on many levels in many ways to stay connected so you won't lose the other person and it becomes so too painful at one point to be too far away from yourself and so whatever you decide to stay together and to do the work to go what is most in alignment with you coming back to yourself home to yourself what is that truest deepest knowing in yourself and then having the choice to listen to that or to not and again whatever you choose life will rise to meet you so moving from moment to moment and checking in again and again and again and what that is 
So recently, I know that you went on a retreat in Hawaii, a spiritual retreat. Mm. Um, how was that? Oh, Gary, this work saved my life. It's my spiritual practice. It's known as Kealahoku, the path of the stars. It's an ancient uh, Hawaiian practice um, taught by my teacher, Jody Mountain, who was taught by her teacher, Kahu Abraham Kauai. In these retreats, I recommend them for everybody. Like, <laughs> um, If you can go to one of her retreats, go. It's work that is beyond the mind. Our mind can only get us to places we've already been. Our mind can only know what it already knows. And there is so much in the mystery and the magic of life that is out there that is beyond anything our tiny mind can plan or imagine. We can only access that if we're able to drop the stories, drop the ego, drop the plans that you have that you think are best and to go into the unknown. So her retreats are literally the unknown. You go in, you have to turn in all your tech. There are no screens. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no email for at least 10 days. There are no clocks. There's just you in the jungles of Hawaii in this space where there are no distractions and when you are faced with yourself where everything else is stripped away, what arises in this space? And that's what's calling for you to look at it. Again, work that you can't understand because the mind's like, wait, what is that? I need to understand. I need, and it's like, no, you won't understand. Your mind will rebel. I will give you one example of an exercise we did. Um, and it was to have a slow race. So for a quarter mile, whoever got from here to that stop sign a quarter mile away would win, but you had to go the slowest. And so literally people were moving so slowly. If you looked at them, you wouldn't be able to tell they were moving. And I was like, I have to move fast. This feels crazy. And then I was like, wait, what is in me that makes me feel like I have to go fast all the time? What is, what am I trying to literally run from within me that is making it so hard to move slowly because what's coming up is something I want to avoid. But in that space, you're confronted with it. And it's fascinating, whatever I discover. I've gone to multiple retreats because I always discover more of myself and whatever is meant for you will show up for you. There's no curriculum. There's no one size fits all. It's a fascinating journey into the mystery of the unknown and more of life. And I can't even explain in a way that makes sense to your logical mind because it will never make sense to your logical mind, but it's not for your logical mind. So just go. Anyways, that's <laughs> journeys into the jungles of Maui. Is it um, a bit like I'm relating different modalities, but whether it's psychedelics or being in a dark room or breath work or meditation that it transforms you to other realms of consciousness or dimensions that you don't go with your mind is that through some of these ancient practices um, that the experiential stuff that you can experience like more of yourself beyond the mind so it allows you access to an opening that is i imagine very similar to what you're able to access through psychedelics but without any psychedelics and it makes you realize that you always have access to this in any moment and it's a being in the present moment and being connected to life where there are no barriers, no restrictions, nothing preventing you from being in the flow of source. It's incredible work and it saved my life. So of all the things I've done, I've done a lot of things. I've, I've spent six figures on personal growth work, personal development stuff, Hoffman process, everything of everything I've done. It's the most healing and profound for me personally on my journey. And I would wholeheartedly recommend it to anybody who it resonates with. So how do you think differently, act differently as a result of going through this transformational work? So there is a deepening in the trust and the magic. I mentioned earlier, I wrote a children's book. And how it came to me was I was literally, after doing so much of this work over the time I've been doing it, um, sitting in a bathtub, my girlfriend's place, just Friday night, taking a bath. I heard slash felt, Ivy, you have to go to the ocean right now. And I was like, wait a second, what is that? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know if you've ever gotten like an intuitive nudge. This is an intuitive scream. And I was like, whoa, this has never happened before. Like I've never, I, am I going crazy? I didn't have, you know, I'm not, there's no substance involved, but I was being pushed to go. So I listened, I listened and I went to the ocean and this book, this children's book that I wrote is what came through me through that experience. It was not from my mind. I could not have thought it. I could not have come up with it. It didn't come from me. It came through me. 
And I don't know if you or others have had the experience where you just get intuitive hit. You should talk to this person. You should do this. You should, you know, like I know you live in the space of connected with intuition all the time, but what this how I'm able to move now is being open to life, being able to hear and to listen when there, those nudges come up, to be able to trust life to lead and to the magic that unfolds as a result. You know, the people I talk to, the opportunities that come up and arise when I just listen and trust and allow and surrender, you know, like I've become the dominatrix who's a really big fan of surrendering to life. <laughs> you know, it's not to another person. It's not in the context of a dungeon. It's to the greatest force of all, which is pure source, pure life, pure energy, the mystery that grows the leaves from the trees and makes our eyes lubricated, just the mystery of all these things that we can't explain with our minds, but that are. And so you always have access to that. And what this work has allowed me is greater access to that. And like uh, reconnected because of somehow you just popped up in the thoughts numerous times to reach out to I looked at the message again last night before our chat today. Hey, Ivy, I, I don't know why, but you keep popping up in my thoughts and somehow you're asking me to reach out to you. And then just, um, I think a week before our podcast, which is uh, last week, the first time I had a lucid dream was a week early. And the week later, I was in a taxi ride with you in Hong Kong. And <laughs> and this is in the dream. And I was explaining you the difference between the waking dream and the sleeping dream, what the shaman teaches. And, and it's like somehow like, hey, this is actually a dream as well. And I don't know why you were in that dream because I don't think about it. That is the only ever time that you have came up in my dream. So I don't fantasize about you. We um, don't know to understand, but we can receive the messages that are revealed to us and we can follow them and listen to them and be open to them. I love it. That's the magic. And here we are now. So um, I guess as a final question, thank you for being so generous with your time. Uh, what can you share that can help people to better navigate their awakening journey? Like you've started this journey when you're 18, as you have gone through a lot of the, the dark moments and moments that it may seem very alone and scary at times and confusing. And with awakening journey, some people could be facing sexual abuse. Some people could be facing financial ruins. Some people can facing a loss of a loved one. So it comes in different forms. So nevertheless, the flavor is it can be extremely confusing and unknown. Mm -hmm. So how do people like find a way in this awakening journey? So the beautiful and the terrifying thing is that we are made up so much of our beliefs. And the thing about beliefs is that they were all learned somewhere along the way which means they can be unlearned. And so often we cling to a belief as if it is our lives. You know, like we believe that the belief, the ego, that this is literally keeping us alive and it's not. So many people will fight to the death for their beliefs. And we're seeing that so much in so many ways now because they believe that if they don't have that belief, if it's not true, they will literally die. You won't die, don't worry. <laughs> you know? Like there's always more out there. What are the possibilities? I believe that the more aware we can become of different beliefs we have, the more choice we have about whether to continue to embrace that belief is true. Is it helping us? Is it still relevant? Is it still true? And if not, what else is out there? And with choice comes incredible freedom because no longer are we so desperately clinging to one thing that must be true. We have space to consider the infinite possibilities that might be true. And then we can choose what is most best, most nourishing, most loving, most supportive, most congruent with us as we continue to move towards our highest and greatest good in alignment with our deepest integrity. And so allow yourself to be curious, to be open, and to discover what awaits you in the unknown. Wow. And I relate to that. It's almost like in a relationship, sometimes when we have to part ways with certain people, we see it as failure and it hasn't worked out, it's bad. But very often, if I met you, we met up at an event, we say goodbye, or we had caught up for dinner and we say goodbye, we don't see it as bad. It's just bye. It may be bye forever. We, we may not catch up. We may not talk. But there isn't any attachment to it. And that's what's beautiful. And if same thing as the people facing financial ruins, well, there's people that's 
paying a couple dollars to go camping, to go on an adventure, and with barely any external luxuries. So whatever the circumstances, it can be a, an adventure, it could be whatever meaning that you define it to be, but you have to be open as per what you just said. Thank you so much. So um, can you share a bit more about the work that you do? What do you focus on these days? Who are the type of um, clients that you tend to work with? Mm -hmm. So these days I work as a therapist. I do coaching and therapy internationally. Um, My work is uh, primarily online. When the pandemic uh, shifts a bit, there'll be in-person retreats and workshops available again. Um, You can find me uh, at my website, bearivy.com, B-A-R-E, bear your soul, bearivy.com. You can find me on Instagram at bearivy, Twitter at bearivy. It's all bearivy. And I love working with people who are ready to free themselves from who they've always been into who they were meant to become. And so I love working with people who are interested in healing codependency, who are ready and willing to deep dive into who they are, what they want, and taking action to do things differently, to get different results. So if nothing changes, nothing changes. So And I know that you also do a lot of work with various cultures, especially like from from my perspective of the Asian culture, there's a lot of existing dogma, every culture as well, but mm-hmm. I've I've known it because I'm Asian. Um, mm-hmm. a lot of existing belief systems and framework that's been put in. You've also do a lot of work in that area as well. Yeah, I do. I, I also specialize in Asian, Asian American mental health. And the thing is it's I didn't see any Asian therapist growing up. And I wanted so badly to someone who could just understand my culture, my history, my familial dynamics. Of course, everyone's different, but there are also similarities where there's just a deep, like, ah, you get me. And so I became the therapist I always wanted. And hopefully I can be that for the people who I work with. And I have a lot of clients who are Asian who are like, it's so nice to talk to an Asian therapist. There's something there. There's something to it. You know, and I have clients from all different ethnic backgrounds, nationalities, and there's something to be said for working with a therapist who can relate to you on a very deep level. Ivy, thank you for bearing your soul and being so open and available to us and taking on this enlightened stories of yours um, which i think a lot of us can find at least parts of it that we can relate to mm-hmm. and getting a healing and from some of your wisdom that you've shared so thank you so much and i look forward to our, our next chat thank you so much gary likewise